Mrs. K. Cole James is the founder and president of the Gloucester Institute, a nonprofit organization which trains and nurtures African American leaders, and she does that even when she's not at work. <laughs> She served as director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management under President George W. Bush, and currently Mrs. James sits on several boards, including PNC Bank, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, as well as the boards of the Heritage Foundation, the Salvation Army, T.C. Walker and Woodville Rosenwald School Foundation, and Virginia Commonwealth University. Mrs. James is the author of three books, including her award-winning autobiography, Never Forget. Most importantly, Mrs. K. Cole James is the wife of Mr. Charles E. James Sr. and the proud mother of three children and grandmother to five grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mrs. K. Cole James. Good evening. Wow, that light is really something. Would I, would I upset anyone's equilibrium if I ask you to do that? To move in, like, I mean, because then we're like family and close and together. And... Well, in my very short time here with you, I've been asked to speak to the I in RISE, individual liberty and fidelity. I, um, I want to say a couple of things by way of introduction. Um, for whatever reason, the Lord plucked me out of my kitchen where I was happily a stay-at-home mom, being mother to three children and wife to my husband Charles. It was the pro-life issue that propelled me out of my kitchen and I went to work for an issue that I felt and feel passionately about. I am now, what am I, 64 years old, and I said to Charles, 20 years from now, the issue that will get me out of the bed in the morning and still have me going is going to be the life issue. Because I believe that it is the greatest civil rights issue of our day where members of the human family are discriminated against because of size, age, and place of residence. And so I have always considered myself a worker in the civil rights movement, and I continue to be. But quite frankly, I thought that that was going to be as an activist. Because I got involved because, like you, I cared deeply about this country and about issues that were important to me. So you can imagine my surprise when the Lord took my life into an entirely different direction. It was almost comical that when I was asked to come to the National Right to Life as the spokesperson for the largest pro-life group in the country at the time, they asked because they were in the middle of a political campaign. Now, I had never been involved in politics or government before. But it was important to rally God's people. And it was important to rally the pro-life movement and help them to understand the importance and significance of that issue. And so when I showed up, over at the campaign headquarters and started doing coalitions and meetings and working with them. You can imagine they saw, I, back in that time, I, I actually was, was kind of cute and really skinny. <laughs> and so I presented well. And our family became the, they didn't have a leader of the pro-family movement at that time. They said, would your entire family be the spokespeople for the Bush Quail campaign and head up the pro-family movement. And so I thought it was fantastic because I could say to my teenage kids, you cannot mess up because everybody is watching you because you head up the Bush Quail pro-family movement. Well, during that time, I met a young man who was involved in his father's campaign and we became very good friends. 
and we would call and we would strategize and we would be in meetings together. And this was long before he owned the Texas Rangers or even before he was governor of Texas. And so it should not surprise you that he was the one that convinced me to take off my activist hat and come into government. And he said, Kay, dad is going to need people like you to help his vision for America become a reality. And so I did that, and it would come as no surprise that when he became president of the United States, that I would get that call. And he said, you know, you can hit from several different bases, using the baseball analogy, what position would you like to play? <laughs> and so I came in and I actually, the, the question was put this way, here are several opportunities, which one would you most like to do? And which one do you think would best serve the President of the United States? And they were two different positions. And so I ended up taking the one that I thought would best serve the President of the United States. And so I went into Bush 43. And I will tell you that at some point in my life, I've had the privilege of serving at every level of our country's government, at the federal level, at the state level as a Secretary of Health, as a member of the State Board of Education, at the local level. And so why is all of this of any significance or importance to you? Because I came in when Ronald Reagan was president. My first presidential appointment was from Ronald Reagan serving on a commission. And I came in with a great deal of enthusiasm about what the role of a Christian and government would be. I was going to help take this country into the next century. We were going to change the culture. We were going to do great things for America. And I have to confess to you that after, oh, lo, those many, many years, I have quite a different view about what is the appropriate role of a Christian related to their government. So this doesn't come from someone who has not been there, has not served. It comes from someone who every single day had to get up and go into a government system to fight for the things that you and I believe in. And you have to know that 40 years ago when Charles and I got started, while the room is small now, it would have been even smaller then. And so if you wore the hat of a black conservative, and then if you want to throw in female and Republican along with that, you got called a lot. And so I ended up having to go into and serve in many, many different policy areas, whether it was education, welfare reform, health care reform. At one point, I was actually introduced as the Mikey of public policy. Give it to Kay, she'll eat anything. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you this, that by the time I left government, I had reached quite a different conclusion. Because I oversat the agencies and the departments that had the largest budgets the most money, as well as the most influence in our lives. And so I understand and had to quickly come to understand the role, the rule of law and the role of regulations in our lives. And sometimes I think that we are almost a little off when we think about how in the world we want to stop what's going on out of Washington and out of our state government houses. Because we're under the false impression, in my opinion, that who we elect and the laws that we pass are going to be the things that we really need to put our time, energy, and effort into. And I want to tell you that's just the first step. 
That's just to get you in the door. Because you see, what they cannot get in law, they get in regulation. And so you need to have people there who are willing every day of their lives to get up and read the documents, go through the regulations, challenge the bureaucracy. And so by the time I left government, my new mantra was that the role of a Christian in government was to do more, no more than stop the rot, to block and tackle. And if the ball is going to be advanced in any way, I want you to know that it's going to happen in the private sector. It is not going to happen by using government to change the direction. And so that's the good news and the bad news. But you see, because you see, there aren't that many of us that are willing to put it aside and go into government and first of all, take the grief. I've been through three Senate confirmation hearings where the opposition was determined to do whatever it took to block a Christian conservative from going into government. Charles will tell you about the sleepless nights waiting for the hearings. Joe Biden made my children conservatives. <laughs> because, because I took them to my confirmation hearings and they sat there and they watched what he did to their mom. In one particular hearing, the questioning was so mean, so nasty, that I got a note from the staff sitting in the back that says, I, I don't even know the answers to the questions they're asking you. You just have to survive. You just have to survive. What you have to go through in terms of the paperwork, it's, it's unbelievable. Our lives were laid bare. We had to disclose everything about our lives and our finances. We had to list every wedding present my daughter got because she got married the year I was confirmed for one of those jobs. And I just want you to understand that because you see the time is going to come once again when in fact we have the opportunity for some of you to go in and serve. And I'm not really here to scare you off today, I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to tell you to get ready. Because when the real work is being done outside of government, we've got to have a whole team of people that are ready to go in and block and tackle. And we used to say in the morning, I go high, you go low, we can take them. <laughs> and I used to tell people that I hired, if you don't enjoy eating problems for breakfast, this is not for you. And it was awfully difficult to figure out how we maintained our liberty and freedom by going in and forcing the government to do constitutionally what it was supposed to do. But it requires people who are willing to be the watchmen upon the walls to get that done. And so that eye and rise is absolutely critical and absolutely important to get done. But I want to leave with you a three-part prescription for what I believe, because see, I, I, after the time that Charles and I have spent blocking and tackling and being in the movement, I'm tired of defining the problem. I'm ready to take somebody out. <laughs> I'm ready to get this done. Do you understand? Two, that at my age, it happened on my watch. 
We sat in the movie The Butler and everything that that movie spanned was in my lifetime. When you talk about the breakdown of the black family on my watch, when you talk about the rise of educational disparities on my watch, when you talk about healthcare disparities and you look at the numbers and the research and the data on my watch, and when you wonder what is the energy, the motivation, why do we keep it going? So I have five grandchildren, you heard that. And we have to fight every single day of our lives and the mantra in the James family is not on my watch. Not on my watch. And so we will keep going and, and we remind ourselves every day that we are immortal until Jesus calls us home. Amen. So we can be without fear as we go forward with what God has called us to do. The three-pronged approach in order to bring about real and lasting change in this country I tried to capture it in my second book, Transforming America, from the inside out. Yes, it is political. It is absolutely our responsibility to be involved in government and politics, non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. In order for us to maintain or regain the country that our founders intended, we must be involved in the political process. And so every day we are in working with candidates that share our values and working against those that don't. We must be engaging the culture. Many people have asked me how I feel about the movie The Butler and how they portrayed the presidents, particularly Reagan, and how in fact, and I, <laughs> Charles and I were coming out of the movie and you know I think the lady behind us thought I was a little nuts because I had on jeans and a t-shirt and you know Charles had been out doing yard work and I'm walking out of the movie saying, well, Sweetie, I think they did a good job on capturing the state dinner. That was real, because that's what it was like when we were there. And, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the only problem is, and, you know, we start going through all of this, and, and, and we just shake our heads at the places that God has put us over those many, many years. Well, we're coming out, and, and, and I was not mad at them because they took a movie and used it, and a whole nation is out there believing it's true. They know how to use the culture in order to make their points. I'm not mad at them, I just take notes. We have to influence the culture. We need to make great movies. We need to write compelling books. We need to have art that actually challenges people and changes the culture. So we got the politics, we got the cultural piece, and you know, you know that unless there is a spiritual revival in this nation, it ain't gonna happen, folks. And one of the things that I am so excited about, about being here, and I really want to thank you for inviting me, and I really want to thank you, and I want to echo what another speaker said this morning, uh, I think it was at lunch. We've got a diversity of people here, and we have got to support each other and stand together. Yes. I can't do what you do. And not all of you all can do what I do, going in government and taking that mess all day, every day, and getting up the next morning and doing it again. But Lord knows we can pray for each other. Lord knows we can support each other financially. 
When J.C. Watts left Congress, I said, J.C., you have a moral obligation to go out and become filthy rich because the movement needs your money. We need some black conservative Christian millionaires who understand that they are given that blessing so that God can disperse it among his people. And one of the happiest things that Charles and I have been able to do in the last few years is become givers. I'm, I am so loving it. But I will tell you in closing that the most important and the most significant thing that I do with my life right now has to do with what I believe all of what God did before was leading up to. Because for whatever reason, he's allowed me to serve at the highest levels of every sector of this economy, in the boardrooms of major 100 corporations, as the dean of a major university, in the nonprofit sector, on the board of directors of some of the best and most well-run nonprofits in the country. And I've able, been able to see what leadership looks like on those levels. And so I decided that what I want is Obama 30 years ago. And how I'm going to spend my last years on the planet is bypassing all of those folks. And I'm going to Obama 30 years ago. So I want to identify those young people who have already exhibited leadership potential. I want the ones that are on our college campuses that are college student government presidents, that are presidents of their sororities and fraternities, that are head of the yearbook. And I want them now. And so Charles and I spent an entire year trying to figure out if you had a blank sheet of paper, what would it look like to train that generation so that they can lead this country? And I don't want the good kids that you know that are nice conservative kids. I want the most hardcore leftists you can find. And then I want to mess with their minds and send them back to school confused. And so what I want to do is just show you a little bit in three minutes of what that looks like, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you. Unfortunately, most of us think in very short term ways, in very tactical ways. What is the next piece of legislation? What is the next election that we have to win? All of which is vital and critical, but we also have to have a long-term strategic plan. Demographics tell us that by 2050, this country is going to be led by minority communities. And so it's incumbent upon us to take some of our time, energy, and resources and pour it into those communities. Gloucester is strategic, it is not tactical. We are looking at how to train the leadership for this country 10 years out, 15 years out. And we're gonna need leaders from the African American, Hispanic, and all communities of color. And so some of us have decided to dedicate our lives to find, educate, nurture, and mentor those leaders. I think it's the Gloucester experience as a whole that has made an impression, that it wasn't one conversation, but the idea of solutionism. It wasn't one interaction with the house, but just being here so much. This is something that is in the present, that's going to affect the future. Being in this program has allowed me to, you know, get my basis, get my foundation. The people that surround us um, here at the Gloucester Institute being around Ms. James and her colleagues has just been, it, it's an amazing experience. But to be included in the actual Emerging Leaders program um, was a huge honor for me. You realize your mission, your role, and your responsibility. We are that next generation of leadership.
Holly Knoll is the historic home of Dr. Robert Russo Moten. He was one of the most well-respected African-American leaders in our nation. And if you ever received an invitation to come to Holly Knoll to talk about the important issues of the day, generally you accept it. What better place than where leaders have gathered for generations? What better place to have young people come to receive their mentoring, their training, their education, and their launch into leadership? I want the person who is going to be our senator 20 years from now, and I want them today. I want the person who's going to be a CEO of a major corporation 15 years from now, but I want them today. I want the person that's going to be a college president, but I want them today. And I want them today so that we can expose them to people and ideas and events that are outside of their narrow experience. We want to do that today so that we can have the leadership this country deserves in 20 years. What I want you to know in closing is that that is a five acre home in Gloucester County, which is the cradle of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King went there on his way to Washington to rest before he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech that we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of now. When black college presidents came together to decide how are we going to educate young black youth, they came there and founded the United Negro College Fund. When the attorneys for Brown versus Board of Education were trying to plot a legal strategy for the Virginia case, Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson came there to work through their legal strategy. When, in fact, the Greensboro Four, before they went south to integrate the lunch counters, they met there with other students to plot their strategy. The place is so significant that it was on the national, is on the national, and the Virginia Historic Registry. And God placed it on my heart that we should own that place, we meaning you and me. Because you see, when I went there to check on it, the windows were broken, vines were growing up, mold had taken over the house. And to me, it was a metaphor of what I saw going on in our country and in our community. And Charles and I stood there and said, not on our watch. And so we started a foundation, bought the property. Now listen to this very carefully because it's important for you. We bought it for you so that black conservatives would have a home. We would have a place that's ours. Because you see, when we die in whatever time frame God has in mind, it's important to us to leave a legacy, a place. We have got to stop starting over every generation. Yes. <laughs> and so I want to issue to you the invitation that Dr. Moten issued throughout his life to come to Kapahosik. It's yours. It's yours. It's where black leadership gathered for years. And so it seems to me only fitting and proper and right that if we're going to launch a revolution to save this country, we should have a campsite to do it from. So thank you very much. And welcome to Kapahosa. Come anytime. <laughs>